Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young here with you once again. A little bit of a hiatus. Uh, I, I would blame it on the bye week, but more than anything, I'll blame it on the crappy immune system of my wife and child uh, who have just both been testing me this week uh, as they've decided to get sick at the same time. So for once in my life, I am having to be the man of the house and take care of basically everything worn on me a little bit but we've made it through to the other side and one of them is feeling much better and uh, at some point during one of these videos i'm sure you're going to be able to tell which one is feeling better uh based on who uh is you know getting some words in in the background i already heard her i think so yeah yeah she's uh i don't know what she's doing she's just slumped in her pack and play uh messing with her uh her bluey toys so i'm just gonna let her have at it and hopefully uh it keeps her content uh, one thing that's going to keep a lot of you content, at least before the game takes place, is a trip to the Emerald Isle next year because K-State is getting ready to face Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. And you can join your Wildcats in Dublin by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. I know at the last uh, football game against Oklahoma State, they had the Aer Lingus people out there and they were kind of, you know, celebrating it, showing it off. I know some people won some tickets, won airfare, like good setup there. And uh, it is getting closer and closer to when K-State will head over for week zero with Iowa State. And if you want to be a part of it and don't want to handle uh, a good chunk of it yourself, go to cats to and they're going to hook you up and uh, get it taken care of for you. What we bring you today is a recruiting update, and this is once again an exciting one to talk about because it involves a five-star athlete. Malik Thomas is set to visit now. This came out earlier this week. He will visit the weekend of the KU football game. So Friday the 25th of October would be the start of the visit, uh, and obviously the expectation would be he'll be there uh, in attendance for that football game against KU. And I want to point this out to people that may not remember this. Malik Thomas is the player from the first Jerome Tang season where he, on his own dime, decided, hey, I'm going to go to Madison Square Garden and watch K-State play. Um, what what do you make of another five-star coming to visit K-State, although we're still absent of hearing of any commitments for the Wildcats uh, with some of these high-caliber players? Yeah, it's another data point that they're certainly registering and moving the needle with some of the best recruits in the country. And, and I do think it's kind of like when Chris Kleiman and company got to town, when they just took over, where sometimes you have to take plenty of swings before it gets there. So I do have some reservations on whether or not they ultimately land someone in this particular cycle that they're pursuing. I mean, as in one of those five stars like it. Chris Kleiman, it took a while, right? Right, he, That one class, I think he whiffed on a lot of those guys. Now, a lot of those guys didn't really turn out. Uh, Turner Corcoran's finally having one of his better seasons now, but you got to look at that class with Hayden Pauls. I don't think has really done much. Kai Thomas uh, didn't yeah. necessarily do anything. I mean, in hindsight, that class didn't turn out as good as what many, including myself, envisioned it to be, but there were misses, and then – you give it a year or two and then they started to really click and, and then obviously you end up with the class uh, of Avery Johnson and company. So sometimes you do have to take your lumps before it ultimately comes to bear. I, I think of it that way too. Like when teams like win their first championship, when they win their first championship, it's not usually their first year of competing at a high level. They've typically lost whether in the quarterfinal, semifinal in the championship game once or twice before they get that crown. Um, there's a part of me that thinks that could happen here with this Kansas State basketball recruiting class because they're probably not in the, the top spot for any of them. Now, what, they've hosted two five-stars so far with Darren Peterson and A.J. DeBonza. I'm not sure if there was a third. I know Cam Ward was a third that visited, but he's a four-star prospect. I might be forgetting someone. But they're going to get two more five-stars on campus, and Nate Ament uh, and – and obviously the guy we're talking about now in Malik Thomas. What I will say is in regards to Malik Thomas, as you laid out, I think this is one to maybe watch because he ultimately was interested enough in Kansas State to go to Madison Square Garden on his own dime and watch them play in the NCAA tournament. So I, I think this one is serious. 
And now that he's visiting, I think it's like game on at this point because I think the lack of a visit up to this point, one, I think he has his own stuff to do, right? Obviously, he ready to have his own basketball season. He visited some other places. I think he's taken plenty of visits, so he's being really thorough. But three, I think there was he always, a lot of his articles he's quoted as saying, you know, despite the location or something like that. So I think this is also a trip where Kansas State's going to have to you know, reverse maybe some of those stigmatisms or preconceived notions that he has about Manhattan, Kansas, and show him what the charm is from the place and why it can benefit him moving forward. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a good point about you kind of have to to load up and, and take some of your lumps early on before you actually come through. And I think there's a difference in how this is going for Jerome Tang and company versus like Bruce Weber, where Bruce Weber talked about it in a very defeatist way and was like, you know, well, we, we got into the living rooms of this guy and this guy, but, you know, whatever. The, these guys are actually coming to campus. K-State is actually a player in, you know, the the final five or whatever graphic of the week Joe Tipton's going to put out for us um, because, you know, it, it feels more real with the, this crew and because you've also seen them land this caliber of player in the transfer portal. Or also, I mean, David Castillo should not be written off as a nobody prospect that they were able to come in and get. Um, and obviously, it was down to them and Duke uh, for for Pat and Gongba last year. So, like, they are right in the thick of it for all these guys. It feels more real. And at some point, you would think they're going to be able to kind of bust that seal, especially considering the NIL background that they're going to be able to kind of portray to all of these guys. Yeah, and Bruce Weber got visits from some of these recruits kind of like a Jeremiah Robinson Earl, but I'm not even sure he got an official visit for anyone ranked that high outside of maybe EJ Liddell. But we're talking about now top 10, top 20 recruits, multiple of them, a bunch of them, four or five, maybe six. And you're not just getting a, you know, I, I feel like I need to do something out of the goodness of my heart visit for you. You're, you're actually in the top four or top five. I think they were in the top three or four with EJ Liddell, but I, I struggled to remember them ever getting there with anyone else. And Liddell is like a, a top 50 recruit, but not necessarily top 20. And these guys are putting Kansas in their top three, top four, top five. And it's not like you have absolutely no chance to get any of these guys. Maybe I kind of feel that way a little bit about Darren Peterson, just because I think KU started with such a head start here. But with the other ones, like A.J. DeMonta, like, are they number one? You know, if you ask most people, probably not. But they're one of those three or four schools that can get them. Malik Thomas, are you number one? People are probably going to give UConn the leader in the clubhouse connotation right now. But Kent State's one of the three or four schools that can get them. Uh, Cam Ward, one of the two or three schools that can get them. Nate Met, probably one of the four or five schools that can get them. So, yeah, they're legitimate contenders and not just like, you know, with Bruce Weber, it never felt like they were a legitimate contender outside of maybe EJ Liddell. Yeah. I, I, and again, it'll be interesting to follow and see. I, I'm not going to probably go and say that they, you know, I'm not going to say they land one of these guys until they actually land one of them. Like it's wait and see mode. And I think that's how people should handle it. But I do think there should at least be, um, some heavier interest here and in, in following along and understanding that this is, somewhat of a trend for them and they've just got to kind of keep working at it and, and give it a chance. Cause at the end of the day, I think this staff also understands, okay, let's go big fish hunting in the high school realm. And if that's not going to work out for us, then there's no need for us to, to make hay there. Like no, we because, know we can be successful yeah. in the portal. And the, the, the last thing I'll add to that, not only are they now being successful in the portal, they are also getting, like year by year depth in the portal, where if you look at how the scholarships are allocated, like yes, they got their their rentals this year. A core core, Coleman Hawkins, guys like that, they're coming in. They only have one year left to play. Max Jones in that same category. But then you look up and down, guys like by fall have three years of eligibility. Brendan Hazen has, you know, multiple years. Doug McDaniel has like they're building that depth that you need and they're learning how to do it through the portal now because this program is getting closer and closer to a, a footing where you don't have to be scrambling and just, Hey, we got to get the best team we can get right now 
and screw thinking about next year at this point. They're able to do both right now. And that that's why it gives them a little bit more leeway with in the high school recruiting, you can say, let's go get a guy that can actually make an impact for us. And if we can't, then we're fine, you know, just focusing on the portal. Yeah. I mean, retention's still going to have to play a factor there with some of those guys that do have multiple years of eligibility. But like you said, go get a high school kid that can that is good enough to be really good right now. Because if you get one that can maybe play in the first year, but maybe not, you're probably just develop developing them for the next team. That's, that's yeah. plain and simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving on from basketball, normally talking recruiting with Drew, is there anything in the football realm of recruiting that is catching your eye right now that you want to make everybody uh, kind of up to date on? It's still that Kansas State-Oregon battle for Lincoln Cure, and I say battle, everyone's like, well, he's committed. He is committed, but I do think he's certainly listening to Oregon and has something to be mindful of moving forward, and I think there's conversation between Oregon. Now, with the visit to KU last week when they lost to – was a TCU at Arrowhead? That's what the game he was at. I don't put too much into that one. I don't think there's a lot of clout there uh, to be paid attention to. I, I – you know, KU fans will probably roll their eyes. I get it. But I think you are he's more or less just there visiting his brother. And, well, what about the KU hat? Uh, well, that's a support thing. And if he was wearing a Kansas State hat, I don't think KU would let him have it on the sideline, right? <laughs> so so let's, let's keep it that way. Yeah, I think if he if he showed up wearing the, the K-State hat. Uh, he'd they'd, lose his sideline pass. Yeah, that's he probably crazy. would not be in that situation anymore. And they'd say, you can you can be a paid fan next time. Yeah, so uh, that, yeah. that's what – but I, I do think – like it's worth noting that Oregon is someone to, I don't know if concerned or worried about is as far as I would go. If the visit actually gets planned, then I go to concern or worry. But until then, it's just like something worth monitoring. Yeah. It, 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 that's going to be an, er, an interesting follow. Uh, and again, this is just one of those things where, a, a team like Oregon for a lot of different reasons is going to be a, a, a long-term player uh, no matter what in a, a lot of scenarios. I mean, you think about Oregon might be one of those few teams that has like an emotional pull for somebody like Lincoln Cure uh, that didn't grow up near Oregon or whatever else. Like, there, yes, there are, are really good schools out there that have these talented programs year over year, like, you know, Notre Dame, Alabama, whoever that, but the pull is not the same for Oregon because we're kind of entering the last wave of recruits that like, they grew up thinking that Oregon was the coolest thing on earth. And, and that's, I mean, that's true. Like I was, I was in that wave and I wasn't even as impressionable as like people younger than me would have been. I was like just starting middle school when, when the Oregon uniform craziness was at its peak of interest level and everybody was all in on how fascinating Oregon was somebody like Lincoln Cure, who is, you know, nine years younger than me, I can only imagine uh, what that stretch was like. So I, I can understand uh, why the allure would be there and we'll, uh, we'll have to follow along and see uh, how things kind of continue playing along, but uh, good to, good to mention that there. Yeah, I mean, and that's a and that's a coaching staff that I will say is more geared towards recruiting than even maybe developing or in coaching. Um, they are big on just getting dudes and acquiring talent. So this is the trait that the, this particular Oregon staff is the best at. So that's also why you you hope Cure doesn't go out to Eugene on his own dime, which would be a pretty strong message in its own right, and to get in front of those Oregon coaches that are really good at this part of their job. So. Those things matter to me. Um, I take, you know, consider I consider that a big item uh, when it comes to that. And it's weird how things come about, right? Like I know that maybe Oregon would have taken two tight ends anyway, but if Deshaun Brain doesn't flip to Tennessee, are we having this conversation? Yeah, no, that's and that's that's a good point, and it's one of those uh, kind of domino effects of of recruiting in college football, but. Uh, all right, that'll do it for this week's recruiting update. And next time that you hear from us, it'll be tomorrow. It'll be a similar Friday show to normal. We just won't have a K-State football game to directly preview. But we will talk about the Cats in the bye week. D.Y. showing his support for Lance Leipold and the Buffalo Bulls. I'm tr trying to remind him of better days, and that was when he was at Buffalo. Um, okay, well, I, I hope that he remembers uh, his better days 
it's also after he, October 26th. It's also when he had Andy Kotelnicki. That might oh, that might yeah. be something too. Yeah, I mean, let's maybe bust out a Penn State shirt tomorrow just to rub it into Lance's oh, face a little more. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, that'll do it for us today. Back again tomorrow, talking K State and Big Twelve as the Wildcats get to sit idle this week as everybody else just beats up on everybody. <laughs>